Welcome everyone, and thank you for taking the time to watch this presentation. In this presentation, we'll be going over a lot of information, so please feel free to contact our office with any questions. You may have been given this presentation for various reasons. You may have been told that you have sleep apnea and you want to know about alternatives to CPAP. You may have a child with ADHD or who struggles with bedwetting. It may be because your spouse snores so badly that you sleep in different rooms. By the end of this presentation, our goal is for you to understand that all of these things that may seem very different may have a common root cause. As we go through this presentation, we'll start with a focus on children. If you're here as an adult with sleep apnea, at first it may seem odd that we're talking about children. But what we have learned is that adults with sleep apnea very often had signs and symptoms as children. There's a good chance we may, may describe things that you struggled with as a child. So let's get started. There's a silent crisis in America. ADD and ADHD, bedwetting, difficulty in school, mouth breathing, snoring, restless sleep, delayed stunted growth, nightmares, low IQ, chronic allergies, crowded crooked teeth, dark circles under the eyes, swollen tonsils and adenoids, daytime drowsiness, depression, anxiety, fibromyalgia, obesity, hypertension, aggressive behavior, bruxism, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, opioid addiction, diabetes, dementia, cancer, and premature death. Research has shown that nine out of 10 in America suffer from one or more of these conditions. I'm gonna show you some pictures of children. As you're looking at these photos, think to yourself, do these children look healthy? If you said yes, you're not alone. In the past, I would have thought that they looked healthy too. But now, here's what I see. The first child on the left has a double chin and looks like he's overweight. The second child has dark circles under her eyes, dry lips, a dimpled chin, and a lack of symmetry in her face. The third child has a double chin, a dimpled chin, dry lips, and dark circles under his eyes. Now take a look at this second group of images. Do these children look healthy? The answer is no. The first little girl on the left has dark circles under her eyes, looks tired, has a narrow, small chin, and dry lips. The second little girl has dark circles under her eyes, can't close her mouth over her teeth, very tiny chin, a lack of symmetry, and looks tired and sad. The little girl has, and then the third little girl has dark circles under her eyes, red blotchy skin, a lack of symmetry. She looks tired and sad and has red chapped lips. Unfortunately, this is what a lot of our children look like these days. In fact, this has almost become what normal looks like. So why are we seeing so many children who look like this? Could it be that there's a common cause behind the health concerns that we're seeing? What if these symptoms, such as ADD and ADHD, restless sleep, sleep issues, swollen tonsils, bedwetting, crowded crooked teeth, nightmares, swollen adenoids, daytime drowsiness, dark circles, mouth breathing, difficulty in school, chronic allergies, and snoring are all linked to a compromised airway? And what could be causing the compromised airway? Narrow dental arches, which are underdeveloped upper and lower jaws, a soft diet, weak tongue, processed foods, weak craniofacial muscles, low tongue position, tongue thrust, and limited to no breastfeeding. Take a look at these two images. You may be asking yourself a few questions like, where does this come from? Why are we seeing so many children who have really crowded or crooked teeth? And why do 80% of our children need orthodontics? On this slide, you'll see some images of the ideal five-year-old's teeth. Why don't we see more young children with spaces between their teeth that provide the room for their permanent teeth? Why has this become an endangered species? Is it that all of a sudden children have really big teeth or is there something else going on? Here's what normal craniofacial growth looks like starting at age two and ending at age 17. Most of the growth and development that humans experience takes place in the lower third of the skull, so in the upper and lower jaws. By the age of two years old, the skull is 55% developed. By four years old, that number jumps to 73.33% in males and 77.68% in females. By the age of 12, the skull is 89.43% developed in males and 94.36% developed in females. A normal craniofacial growth is wider, forward, and downward. 
So why? Why are we seeing so many children suffering from abnormal growth and development? To get answers to this question, we're going to take a look at some anthropology. This is Dr. Robert Coricini. Dr. Coricini has a lot of research on the development of the human skull. Today, we're going to take a look at his fossil findings and his population studies. Just a little bit on his credentials, Dr. Coricini is an anthropologist with 30 years of research, seven books, hundreds of published articles, fossil studies, animal studies, population studies, and homozygous twin studies. When Dr. Coricini looked at human skulls from 400 years ago, he found that those skulls had bigger upper and lower jaws, and that there was room for 32 teeth in those jaws. There was very little incidence of crowded or crooked teeth, and there were no orthodontists around to make that happen. In present time, very few people have their wisdom teeth, and many don't even have room for 28 teeth without them being crowded or crooked. Dr. Coricini also studied isolated rural populations groups of people who were not exposed to things like processed foods and formula. What he found was that these populations breastfed their children for at least two to three years, and that they ate a diet that was comprised of hard, tough foods like dried meat and hard root vegetables. In these populations, they had very little incidence of crowded and crooked teeth. They had perfectly formed upper and lower jaws. So here are his conclusions. Dietary consistency and toughness promote proper bone growth. When non-resistant processed foods become ambiguous after industrialization, malocclusion shows a rapid rise, which is cooking tea. Soft or processed foods increase underdevelopment of upper and lower jaws and malocclusion. Dr. Coricini observed as Western culture was introduced into these isolated populations. And here's what he observed. In the first generation after processed foods and soft diets were introduced, 50% of the population began to experience an increase in malocclusion or crowded and crooked teeth. After another generation, this increased to 70%. After a third generation, this jumped to 85%. It takes 27,000 years for a genetic mutation to express itself in 51% of the human population. So how did this happen in just one generation? This tells us that malocclusion is not inherited, it is acquired. This means that crowded, crooked teeth is not caused by genetics, it's caused by something else. It's caused by cultural changes. And malocclusion is a disease caused by Western culture. Unfortunately, in our current society, we no longer breastfeed our babies for two to three years, and we no longer eat a hard diet. Instead, we nurse our babies for six weeks or six months if we can, and then we give them bottles and soft foods like baby food, macaroni and cheese, and chicken nuggets. Here's just a few more examples of what we feed our children. Lots of soft, melt-in-your-mouth types of foods. However, this is what we should be feeding them, those hard root vegetables like Dr. Coricini observed. So here's what we know. Most malocclusion is acquired, not inherited. Malocclusion is unique to Western culture and that the presence of malocclusion is a key indicator of an underdeveloped airway. This is Dr. James Sim Wallace. Dr. Wallace found that an early soft diet prevents the development of muscle fibers of the tongue, resulting in a weaker tongue, which cannot drive the primary dentition out into a space relationship with fully developed arches, which lead to more crowding of the permanent teeth. The tongue is a scaffold for the upper jaws. So we know that having a strong, well-developed tongue is important in making sure that our arches develop correctly. When your tongue is not strong and fully functioning, you'll end up with a V-shaped Gothic arch and crowded, crooked teeth. When your tongue is strong and functions correctly, you'll have a beautiful U-shaped arch that has room for all of your teeth without being crowded and crooked. So here's an image of the maxilla, the upper jaw. Note that the upper jaw does more than just hold the upper teeth. It makes up the sinus cavity and the lower orbits of the eyes. Dr. Goulimalt states that the dental arch expansion improves sleep disordered breathing in patients with upper and lower jaw constriction and can be a valid treatment. These photos demonstrate what our upper jaws look like today compared to what they looked like in earlier times. So on the left, you'll see a modern day jaw, and then on the right, a prehistoric. This image shows that the upper and lower jaws are a major part of our airway development. 
you can see that if the upper jaw is not fully developed, it will affect the nasal airway. In addition, an underdeveloped upper jaw keeps the lower jaw from fully developing because the upper teeth trap the lower teeth and the jaw cannot expand forward to the correct position. When the lower jaw does not fully develop, it impacts the lower airway. So what does your airway look like? What does your child's airway look like? And which airway would you rather have? A narrow straw or a wide garden hose? Everyone's answer should be a wide garden hose. Here are some images of airways. Each area of red indicates restriction. So on the left, you'll see a severely constricted lower airway. And we have a typical mouth breather, a child with Asperger's syndrome, and then an adult with sleep apnea. As you can see in all of those images, there is constriction of the airway. This video here really says it all. Just a few hundred years ago, the human face was different. It was forward grown. Her wide profile and large dental arches ensured straight teeth and room for her tongue. Most importantly, she had plenty of space behind her upper jaw so she could breathe through her nose with ease. The modern face has changed. From childhood, her dental arches are less developed, crowding her teeth and giving her less space for her tongue which impacts her airway. Many believe this stems from a number of causes, such as allergies that affect breathing. Another is the poor nutrition and softness of modern diets, causing toddlers to have underdeveloped chewing muscles and smaller dental arches. Because her upper jaw is too far back, she will struggle to breathe normally through her nose. To get more oxygen, she will compensate by opening her mouth to breathe, bringing her lower jaw down and back, creating a downswing of the face. This is how her undergrown upper jaw creates the appearance of buck teeth. She's actually compensating in order to breathe. If not corrected, the problem carries into adulthood. Extractions were documented in the 1600s as a way to treat crowding. Although they are a quick fix, they don't treat the problem of underdeveloped arches and have been implicated in harming the facial profile, making them the subject of much debate even today. Adulthood. In order to breathe, she will slouch her head forward to prop open her airway, creating a lifetime of neck and back pain. This is the infamous forward head posture. Having a healthy airway is crucial to the survival of life, and especially so during sleep. When muscles around the throat relax during sleep, a healthy airway stays open because the tongue is sitting forward and has enough space to be suctioned up against the fully grown palate. With underdeveloped jaws and dental arches, the palate is too small for the fully grown tongue, which is sitting back to begin with. When she sleeps, her tongue does not suction, rather it falls back and cuts off her airway. This is obstructive sleep apnea. Like crooked teeth, it's a modern condition, however, it can reduce life expectancy. Not surprisingly, obstructive sleep apnea is marked by the same traits that describe the headgear effect. Both jaws are grown down and back, creating a clockwise rotation in the lower third of the face. The myth of the overgrown upper jaw that needs to be held back has long since been replaced with science. Science has shown that young children can be buck-toothed naturally and that the lower jaw catches up over time with a fully developed upper jaw. Essential to this is nutrition, the use of chewing muscles early on in life, and good breathing habits. This means breathing through the nose with the mouth closed and the tongue resting up against the palate. Also, the practice of maxillary expansion has been shown for over a century to correct crooked teeth and improve nasal breathing space. And since 1918, orofacial exercises have been shown to correct mouth breathing habits.
This is Eli. We did not make this video, but it is a great demonstration of what a child looks like when they're struggling to get air when they're sleeping. Please be advised that some viewers may find this video disturbing. It is certainly not intended to upset anyone. It's just the reality of sleep disordered breathing in children. see what happens. This is February 6, 2009. There he goes. He shakes. He's seven. Okay, we'll get this up. Okay, now let's listen again. Quiet. In a few seconds, he'll probably hold his breath again. You can hear him snoring. He's breathing through his mouth, not through his nose. And he's not congested now. gasping for air. The breaths they took beforehand, he was actually not getting anything into his lungs. Now again, he's only kind of, he's not really getting anything in right now. Now he's going to take a deep gasp in a few seconds. There he goes. Again, he's going to start holding it. All of these breaths that he's taking right now, he's not really getting much into his lungs. There he goes. Now, every time he shakes like that, he's essentially disrupted his sleep. Now he's holding it. That was holding it. He's still holding it. He's trying to take in air. There he goes. Okay, now watch. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's holding it. He's still holding his breath. And now he's going to gulp again. There he goes. That was it again. And again. He's holding. He's holding. He's trying. There he goes. So this has been three minutes and 15 seconds, and you can see how many episodes he's had of not getting calm breaths in. Now, watch what happens when I take his jaw and I just bring it forward. If I can, let's see if I can. Let me open his airway. Bring his airway forward. Now listen to the quiet breathing. There we go. Now he's breathing through his nose. And I brought his airway, I'm opening his airway, just pulling his jaw forward ever so slightly. Breathing through his nose quietly. His mouth is a little bit open, but he's breathing through his nose. Just by hearing how quietly he's breathing, you don't hear him anymore. And all I did is gently bring his jaw forward. That's it. Essentially allowing the air to go in through the nose and clearly down. 
into the trachea. Tonsils aren't blocking anymore. I'm gonna let go. Let's see what happens. Have you ever seen other children who look like this when they're sleeping? So what does this tell us? It tells us that the development of the upper and lower jaws have a huge impact on how we breathe. That starts when we're young. So what happens when the upper jaw is underdeveloped and a person is not able to breathe through his or her nose? So they, they breathe through their mouth. When you breathe through your nose, the air is warmed, filtered, and humidified. When you breathe through your mouth, however, this doesn't happen. So unfiltered, dry air is hitting your tonsils. And what happens is that you end up with inflamed and swollen tonsils, which further impact your ability to breathe. In addition, nitric oxide is produced in your sinuses. Nitric oxide is a vaso vasodilator, which helps our bodies absorb oxygen. When you breathe through your mouth, the oxygen is not mixed with nitric oxide. So your body does not absorb the oxygen as efficiently. Nasal breathing is very important for our bodies and for our health. Next, we're gonna take, take a look at some research done by Dr. Egil Har Harvold. Dr. Harvold did some research on young adolescent monkeys. He blocked their noses and did airway studies to see the impact of mouth breathing. He found that nasal obstruction leads to mouth breathing and a low tongue pos posture, which leads to malocclusion. The pictures on the left are pictures of the monkeys before their noses were blocked. And then the pictures on the right hand side are the monkeys uh, are after the monkeys were forced to become mouth breathers. Look at the differences in how the monkeys look after such a short time. On the left hand side, you can see that now their mouth posture is open. And then on the right hand side, you can see the changes in teeth alignment. So here's what we know. When you have a compromised nasal airway and you breathe through your mouth, it leads to low tongue posture. It causes tonsils and adenoids to swell. Another researcher by the name of Dr. Stem Linder Arson did studies on children. He looked at children who were mouth breathers versus children who were nasal breathers. And he found that nasal obstruction leads to mouth breathing, which leads to low tongue posture and high rates of malocclusion. So it's really important that we get people to breathe through their noses. So how does this all connect to ADD and ADHD? Well, when you have a child who is mouth breathing and has a small airway, it impacts how the child is able to sleep and may cause the child to experience restless sleep and nighttime arousals. When a child does not get a good night's sleep, it impacts their life. This is Dr. Ben Moralgia, and he's going to share how airway and sleep may be linked to ADD and ADHD. Take a child, alter their quality of breathing and sleeping. And the real big issue now is how will they be during the day? So now you take a child who's five, six, seven, eight, it doesn't matter. Their issue has begun years ago. So it's not like you had one or two bad nights of sleep. You've had a poor quality of sleeping and breathing for years. And the parents have been struggling with so many different issues, and not the least of which is the ADD, ADHD discussion. Because the child who doesn't get a proper night's sleep with a good quality of breathing throughout the entire night is gonna wake up and be unrested. And when you get a child who's had a poor quality night's sleep, poor breathing all night long, and you make that happen for years, you know what you've got? A six, seven, or eight year old that's gonna to go to school and have trouble learning, have trouble sitting still, have trouble behaving, have trouble cooperating, basically have trouble fitting in to what is supposed to be a quiet and peaceful and learning environment. And it's not long after that where the phone call comes to the parent. And when the phone call comes to the parent from the school, what happens is we have little Jimmy here and he's a little bit disruptive and we really want you to have him evaluated for ADD and ADHD. They're going to be diagnosed with ADD and ADHD and our solutions are pharmaceutical. 
if we are given a pharmaceutical, it's usually in the form of some sort of a stimulant. And what that does to the child is it kind of pushes them over the edge and it brings them back to calm. So you basically take an excited or hyperactive child, you stimulate them more, and you bring them back to so-called calm. But it doesn't make a better learning child. You're not going to have a child who's able to learn as well. So now you might have the child sitting still in class because they might be a little more numb or relaxed or calm, but it doesn't necessarily make them a better learner. If we have the so-called ADD, ADHD diagnosis, we're talking about hyperactivity. We're talking about all of the things about behavior and development that land in this category. And the interesting thing about research is, and there is current, ongoing, and past research that shows, children who are sleep deprived produce the same exact symptoms as kids who are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD. In fact, there's a nice study that showed children who were diagnosed with ADD and ADHD were mixed with children who were sleep deprived. And in that group of kids, when they tried to analyze them and look at their symptoms and diagnose them, they couldn't tell them apart. And if you have a group of kids and you can't tell apart who's an ADD child and who's a sleep deprived child, it's no surprise that maybe the ADD and ADHD has a cause. And maybe that cause has to do with the quality of the breathing and the sleeping overnight. And there's a lot of research out there. And one of the, one of the pioneers here is a Dr. Stephen Sheldon out of Lori Children's Hospital in Chicago. And he does a wonderful job of researching. And over the decades, he's come to a conclusion. And I, I've, I've seen him speak. And it's not soon after he jumps on stage and he makes a statement that ADHD and ADD do not exist. They are an outcome of a sleep disorder breathing. They're an outcome of a poor quality of sleep. It's all about the quality of sleep. Another researcher who's produced beautiful research on the same topic is Dr. Karen Bonnick out of Einstein at Yeshiva University. Dr. Karen Bonnick has the largest study to date. 11,000 children were watched over seven years, and they were divided into two groups, sleep disorder breathing children and children who do not have sleep disorder breathing issues. The children in the sleep disorder breathing group, over their seven years, her study showed that they were 50% more likely to be diagnosed with an ADD or ADHD diagnosis and treated with medication. 50% is a coin toss for our child to be diagnosed and treated with a medication. Also in her group, they were doing testing. They were doing IQ or intelligence testing along those seven years. And the children with the sleep disorder breathing, their, their intelligence testing, their IQ scores were dropping over those seven years. And that's really not the way it works when you're growing and forming. The formative growing years for a child when they're sleeping and breathing well, your IQ raises to a certain point and then you kind of plateau. We don't see IQs diminishing amongst children. So this is the research that Dr. Mrazia uh, references from Dr. Karen Bonnick. She studied 11,000 children over six years, and she found that there was a strong and persistent association between sleep disordered breathing and diminished IQ. She also found that sleep disordered breathing increases the risk of being diagnosed with ADD or ADHD by 50%. So now you may be asking, how is this all connected to bedwetting? Dr. Mrazi is going to explain the connection between bedwetting, airway, and sleep. Another thing that might happen is bedwetting. Bedwetting, it's a little more common than people are aware because it's also a best kept secret. Not many people are running around and advertising that their child is bedwetting at the age of five, six, seven, 10, 14 years old. But bedwetting, does have a relationship to how we're breathing and our quality of sleep. And some of the causes for bedwetting relate to the, the way oxygen is exchanged in our body. And the way I'll describe it is this. If we're breathing through our mouth, that air coming into the lung isn't really filtered, warmed, or humidified appropriately, and the body can't exchange it appropriately. So a little less oxygen goes to the brain. Now the brain is a very sensitive organ. When the brain recognizes little changes in oxygen, it goes to work immediately. Because once the brain starts to recognize a little less oxygen, it doesn't know if we're being choked to death, a very serious condition, or if there's an imbalance in how we're breathing at night, but it does start to trigger a little bit of the fight or flight response. And a little bit of the fight or flight response means the brain's gonna look at the body and say, all right, if we've got a little bit of an oxygen issue going on, I'm gonna pull oxygen from something that it picks to be unnecessary right now, and maybe deliver it somewhere that might be more important, planning on the a, a rare occurrence as if the oxygen was gonna stop. So if the brain's recognizing a little less oxygen, all of a sudden it's pulled from the urinary tract. If the body pulls a little oxygenation from the urinary tract, it might void, so we might wet the bed.
So what can we possibly do? It may not be what you think. Meet Connor Deegan. On the next slide, we'll watch a video that was made by Connor's mom. He was not treated with Vivos appliances, but it's still a very powerful video on how airway and sleep impact a child.
So what do we do now? How can Dr. Rogers and dentists in general help? This is Hunter. Hunter struggled with bedwetting. When you look at his teeth, he has a deep bite and no room for his permanent teeth to come in. Now we know this is a sign of, an underdevel of underdeveloped upper and lower jaws. This is what he looked like after 10 months in treatment with Vivos. He stopped wetting the bed after just one week in treatment. Why? Because he was able to breathe better and sleep better. This is Paige. Paige also had a deep bite and a lot of crowding. This is what Paige looked like after her treatment. Look at the beautiful development of her upper and lower jaws. Truly remarkable transformation. And I don't know if you remember those images that I first showed you in the beginning of what we thought maybe a healthy child looked like. Well, this is the first boy, Michael. Michael at the age of nine on the left-hand side and then Michael at the age of 14 after treatment. Look at the difference in Michael's teeth, and the way that his jaws are formed. Life saved and a hopeful future. But better than that, look at the changes in Michael's airway. You can see how much it just opened up after treatment. So now you may be wondering, well, what about me? What about my spouse? What about my child? Meet Dr. Tara Griffin from Florida. She transformed, transformed her life and then her practice. I'm gonna watch a video that she made. I'm Dr. Tara Griffin. We are here today in my clinic in Panama City Beach. I've been practicing dentistry for over 11 years. Before I discovered the Vivos appliance, I was suffering every day with chronic head and neck pain, TMJ pain. I was practicing dentistry and been practicing for five years, but I was already looking for an out. I knew that with this much pain, I could not continue to practice dentistry. I had chronic sinus and allergy problems, bronchitis. Um, I was not sleeping throughout the night very well, I was waking up during the night. I had severe daytime fatigue where I would need to go home and actually take a nap in the afternoon just at lunch, you know? And so I was looking for a solution to the problem, but I didn't know what the root cause was until I learned about the Vivo Suppliance. As soon as I started treatment with the Vivo Suppliance, within the first two nights, I was sleeping soundly throughout the night. My energy was better during the day. The pain that I was undergoing took a bit longer to get resolved, but within the first three to four weeks, my pain level was reduced by two thirds or more. Within a month's period of time, I was breathing through my nose better. I wasn't having the same sinus symptoms that I was having before. And within three months of treatment, my asthma had improved so much, I had no more problems with the inhalers and the frequency I was having to use with all of my asthma inhalers. My overall health started to improve very quickly. I was my own first patient. However, as I continued to treat the next patient and the next patient going forward, I was curious to see if they were gonna have the same outcome that I had, and they did. Nine out of 10 had the very similar outcome that I had. So they were sleeping better in just a few nights getting their energy back. Uh, they were less irritable. The pain that they had was going away very quickly. The teeth were beginning to straighten and align over time. So even though with this type of problem, it can take some time to get the long-term results, the immediate symptoms start to improve very quickly. Comparing my before and after picture with the Vivo Suppliance, uh, my smile was not symmetrical. My teeth were crowded. Uh, the gumminess of my smile was a, was a major problem that I didn't like. I had unevenness in my eyes, um, also in my nose. My face was more round and less balanced, and that all helped to correct itself as well as I went through the treatment. 
When the Vivo's appliance is worn in the early evening and while you sleep at night, it allows the jaw to relax. It allows the airway to open up. It allows you to breathe through your nose and to get the oxygen that you need to the rest of your body for your body to begin to heal. By breathing through our nose, we are actually getting much more oxygen to our brain as well as our lungs and we're producing nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator to allow the blood flow and everything to circulate better. And so a big component with this is it forces you to actually breathe through your nose to get the oxygen where it needs to go into the body. So that's a very important part of this. If you're interested in learning more about the Vivos appliance, if this would be good for you, then I recommend you coming in to a Vivos center to be evaluated to determine if this is something that could help you. So that was just a little bit about Dr. Griffin's experience with Vivos herself. Now here are the changes to Dr. Griffin's airway. Notice that after 15 months of active treatment, the upper airway volume increased significantly. There is no longer the extreme re restriction that can be seen in her pre-treatment x-rays. So as we saw earlier, that would be on the left-hand side, the red areas are where you'll see restriction in her airway. And then on the right-hand side, 15 months after her treatment, her airway has increased significantly in volume. Here are some remarkable clinical outcomes from treatment in adults. You can see on this patient here that as she progresses through treatment, her face shape begins to change. They're quite remarkable. Now here's a testimonial from another adult patient. She said, when smiling, I noticed that I am now physically unable to smile as big as I used to. My gums are now barely showing. My face feels different when, I, when she smiles and she doesn't know how to explain it, but it's a great thing. She also said that when she speaks and eats, her jaw no longer pops. Um, she can speak more clearly and feels a noticeable difference in the amount of room that her tongue has. She can breathe very well through her nose and she's very happy with the results. So expanding the dental arches promotes healthy nasal breathing, discourages or eliminates mouth breathing. And nasal breathing prepares air by filtering, warming, and moisturizing it for optimal simulation in the lungs. So you want to train the tongue um, by strength, with strength and conditioning, repositioning the tongue up and forward, promoting proper swallowing and speech, and then eliminate bad habits such as thumb sucking, tongue thrust, and reverse swallow. The Vivo system is a treatment system made up of screening, medical imaging, and diagnostics. After the initial screening, imaging, and diagnostics, a personalized interdisciplinary treatment procedure will be created for the patient. Next, oral appliance therapy will begin, followed by integrative therapy and patient treatment technology. Here's a brief video describing the breathing wellness movement. I really feel like Vivos is one of the great answers to the healthcare crisis that's in America because we're getting to the root cause of what ails a lot of us, and that is not breathing well and not sleeping well. Trace back the journey of a, of a sleep apnea patient. That patient is suffering for years before they ever get diagnosed. Once they are diagnosed, they're presented really with two fundamental options. You can go into CPAP and wear a contraption over your face every night for the rest of your life, or you can have what's called a mandibular advancement device, which will actually protrude your lower jaw in an unnatural position to hold your airway open while you sleep and you can wear that for the rest of your life. Either of those two modalities are going to present that patient with a, a life sentence of having to wear this, this contraption, one or the other, for the, every night for the rest of their life. The interesting thing about 
uh, CPAP and oral appliances is although they're very effective treatments, if they're used over a lifetime, the person's condition actually gets worse over time. Along comes Vivos and says, wait a minute, we have a better option that's all natural, non-invasive, non-pharmaceutical. We can say to a patient, you go into this oral appliance therapy with our protocols and you go through this treatment for 12 to 24 months and at the end of that time, there's a high, high probability that you will no longer have to wear an appliance or any kind of device. Vivos is literally changing my patients' lives. It has drastically changed my life. I don't have to use the CPAP anymore. Within just a couple of weeks of using the appliance, I was able to breathe through both nostrils, something I couldn't do my entire life. This was revolutionary. Pretty much made me feel excited about life again. She's sleeping better, I'm sleeping better. You really feel like you've been given a new life. It's amazing. I wake up and I'm not in pain. Because she's sleeping better, because her attitude during the day is better. Mm -hmm. I have a better quality of life now. I can't say enough good about it. I'm getting instant benefit from it. I was amazed. I dreamed every night for two weeks straight, and I told my wife, I said, it's amazing. I feel sharp now. I don't, I don't feel drowsy all the time. It's been a long time since I felt this good. I wouldn't lay down and try to sleep right now without my Vivos device. My asthma has gotten much, much better. Without the Vivos, I wouldn't be outside right now. There's no numerical value you can put on this kind of a change. I smile, and I haven't smiled for a long time. <laughs> right after I started using it, I noticed the results really, especially with the snoring. My sleep apnea episodes are a fraction of what they were before. This product's phenomenal. It's, uh, it changed my life. It's a very comfortable process, but I can see dramatic differences. Now I can really open my mouth. Before, it would almost always click. His ADHD is calming down. He's doing better in school. I can definitely see the difference and the change in him. It's a miracle. <laughs> I get to do things now that I would not have been able to. I would not hesitate to do it again. I am 100% happy that I did this. And I am thankful every day that I have it because I can breathe. We bring hope to the millions of people and the millions of families men, women, and children who suffer from this disease. It promotes the body's own ability to heal itself because now the body can breathe and sleep well. That's exciting. It is truly amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this presentation. We hope that this information has helped you to recognize if some symptoms of sleep disordered breathing are present in either yourself, your child, or someone that you love. And that just because those symptoms are present does not mean that they can't be fixed. Give the office a call at 570-253-5000. We'd be happy to answer any of your questions or even get you or a loved one set up with your first appointment. This is your first step to a happier and healthier life. Thank you again.